Yeah. Next time we meet. Um, yeah. So I'm going to do that. So I couldn't, there wasn't any more available. So once she gets settled, we can start. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the spring New England Aquarium Lecture Series. This is our last lecture, technically, of the spring series, even though it's summer. Um, welcome you all here tonight on a beautiful night. It's a great pleasure to be here. My name is John Mandelman. I am the Vice President and Chief Scientist of the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life, which is the Research and Conservation Division here at the New England Aquarium. So I just want to acknowledge the Lowell Institute. They provide funding to support this lecture series, which allows us to show all of our lectures for free to the public. I'd also just ask right now that everybody silence your cell phones or tablets or anything else you might have, uh, just out of respect to, to the, the process tonight and the, and the lecture. Tonight's lecture is going to be live streamed, actually, and recorded. Uh, this lecture, as well as all the other, or many of the others from our lecture series, are available uh, on the uh, New England Aquarium's YouTube channel and the WGBH forum network. So you can always refer them to family or friends. And I'll be saying a little bit more about uh, our fall lecture series at the culmination of tonight's program. So tonight, um, I get the privilege of introducing an introducer, which is always fun. Um, my colleague and friend, Michael, Dr. Michael Telusti, is here with me tonight. We're actually co-hosting tonight's lecture for the New England Aquarium lecture series uh, with the School for the Environment at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. We have a partnership between the New England Aquarium and SFE at UMass Boston. And um, Dr. Telusti is actually a long time, was a long time colleague of mine here at the aquarium as a senior scientist. And now he's uh, an associate professor over at UMass Boston the School for the Environment for uh, sustainability um, and food solutions. So uh, I will now welcome Michael to come up and introduce tonight's lecture. Thank you, John. <clears throat> um, I'm super uh, pleased tonight to, um, to welcome host author Paul Greenberg. He's here talking about the omega principle. And in this book, he probes the rich and surprising history of omega-3s. They've long been celebrated by doctors and dietitians as a key to a healthy heart and a sharper brain. And just for a show of hands, how many people here take some sort of omega-3 supplement? Not surprising, because it actually is um, one of America's most popular dietary supplements. Um, but right now, there's a little bit of been some press in the news um, about maybe they're not all that they're promised to be. Uh, and tonight, Paul's actually going to begin to um, 
unpack some of this and look at the creatures that are the victims of the industry, the reduction industry that's creating these omega-3s. And, um, and it's these animals that are really, they're key in ecosystems and they're essential to the survival of whales, penguins, and fish of all kinds, even those that we eat. In his presentation, Paul's gonna take us on a journey from the dawn of complex life when these compounds were first formed to human prehistory when the discovery of seafood may have produced major cognitive leaps for our species and on to the modern era when omega-3s may point the way to a bold new direction for our food systems. Paul is the author of the James Beard award-winning Four Fish as well as American Catch and he's a regular contributor to publications, um, including the New York Times. And look, tomorrow he actually has a, a news story out on the Mediterranean diet, which he has renamed the Pescatranian diet. Did I get that right? Good. Pescatranian, okay. Um, and after this uh, talk, Paul is on a book promotion tour. He will scurry out to the library, so, or to the library, to the lobby, so he can sign books. So if you want to get a book afterwards, it's a fascinating book. I really highly um, suggest everybody read it. Um, and so let's welcome all the way from New York City, Paul Greenberg. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, John. It's really great to be um, back at the New England Aquarium. Uh, I have to say it's a little intimidating to be at the IMAX theater. Um, you know, I sort of want to say, in a time before time, in a place before places. Because um, it's it, you know, it's very sci-fi looking. But I'm actually really happy to see such so many people come out on a nice warm summer day to talk about omega-3 fatty acids. Because what what else would you want to talk about on a, on a warm day? Um, so Michael sort of kicked off the, the, uh, the interactive aspect of this, but I want to take it a step further. I always like to get a sense of how fishy the audience is. I'm, ex I'm expecting a fishy audience, but first of all, um, raise your hand if you've ever been fishing in your whole life. All right, Extreme, you, you're like blowing away Seattle. This is great. Um, raise your hand if you're the kind of fisherman or fisher person who would fish in a puddle if you thought you might catch something. All right, it's good. It's good to, yeah, see, these are where the tough questions come from. The really, that, that was me. Um, raise your hand if you eat fish once a week. Very, very fishy. Again, Seattle is in shame right now. Uh, raise your hand if you eat fish twice a week. Again, very shameful for Seattle. Um, raise your hand if you've ever gone for an entire year where you ate fish for every single meal for an entire year. Okay, I did, but that was research for this book. So we can talk about that too. That, that's, that's more for the Q&A. Um, all right, so we'll have other questions that'll come up and there'll be lots of time for Q&A. So if I don't get to your, you know, exactly which supplement you can take question, we'll get to it at the end. Um, so uh, the Omega Principle. Well, this is the book that, I'm work that I've been working on for four years now. Um, you know, most people tend to know me uh, for this book, uh, Four Fish, The Future of the Last Wild Food. Um, and I came to it, as my first question would indicate, through fishing. Um, I'm a huge fisherman. I was fishing ever since I was three years old. Um, and and um, four fish is really about the kind of conflict between wild and farmed. A um, hundred years ago, everything that we ate from the sea was wild. And now we're just crossing the point where more than half of what we're eating from the ocean is farmed. So a real epical shift. Um, I went on to write another book called American Catch, which looked a lot about like imports versus domestic fish. Um, but those two books, I, I was sort of always in this paradigm of like, are we fishing too much? Did we catch too many fish? Is there enough left? What are we doing? Are we farming? Da, da, da. And it was this sort of um, repetitive pattern that I got in where we was, we were, I was just mostly talking about fishing and farming, fishing and farming. And I never got to the point where I was talking about these really much bigger questions that are going on with the ocean, questions of ocean acidification, the major changes in planktonic cycles, all these different things. And so before I headed into another book, I kind of took a pause and tried to think, well, you know, I want to write about plankton and krill, copepods, all these kinds of things. I want to write about them, but, but, but how can I write about them? And so, you know, I thought for a while, and the sort of first draft of a cover I came up with was this, um, four really small things. And, uh, and I realized that, like, 
it's really hard to get the general interest audience interested in krill and, and, and copepods and little silvery fish uh, clupeids. And, I, and I, I realized it just wasn't going to work. So my, um, my partner is actually, she's a statistician and um, very good at looking at data. So we, we did a huge meta-analysis that included over 50 million subjects. And, and we, we came up with this graph um, where you see that, um, that self-interest for humans is way up around 8,000 units. Whereas planetary interest is only 2,000 units. So, you know, we, you know, this was compiled major, major study in our house at 176 Broadway. And um, we concluded that if we were going to, if I was going to write a book um, that would look at some of these really important changes, we would have to look at something that was of interest to everybody. So, again, we're not going to write four really small things. But I realized that there was this lens through which I could look at all of these problems. And that was this. The omega-3 supplement. So as we saw, many of you take this omega-3 supplement. The other thing, however, going on with me and this book and this whole process was that as I headed into this book, I turned 47, and I had um, a major full-on midlife crisis on my hands. So like all those things that start to attack you in middle age were attacking me. My, my knees hurt, my pressure, my pressure was up, uh, uh, my, I was foggy thinking, all these kinds of things. I was really kind of feeling very much like I was turned 47 and 50 was just around the corner. And so I, I was kind of feeling like, oh gosh, I, I, I need to get past this in some way. And whenever, um, I'm not a huge uh, fan of, of medicine. My apologies to any doctors in the audience, but I, I don't like pres pres taking prescription medication. My father's a psychiatrist. He's always willing to help with a prescription, but um, no, no, I, I joke, I joke. Um, but no, but I, I just didn't want to get involved with that kind of stuff. So I, I would find myself, I'm a terrible sleeper. I'd be up in the middle of the night and I'd be Googling and I'd Google things like, you know, what, what, what would help with my joints, what would help with my heart, da, 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 da. And every time I Googled some health thing with, you know, a homeopathic cure, every single time the thing that came up was omega-3 fatty acids. And then one night when I was up in the middle of the night, I was like, well, what would happen if you put into Google omega-3s may? So I did that, and, and you get this totally crazy list of things that omega-3s may do. Um, they may um, help with ADHD, brain volume, muscle mass. My favorite one is omega-3s may boost sperm competitiveness. And, and it was funny, you know, like I, when I saw that, I was like, okay, that's totally going in the book. So I put it in the book, and then actually when I was out in Seattle, I, I was doing this talk, and, and somebody raised their hand and said, well, why would you care about sperm competitiveness? And, and I, I realized I didn't know. I, well, I mean, I obviously want my sperm to be the most competitive sperm, um, and omega-3s can help them. Um, so I thought, um, you know, so, so it was all these crazy things, and then, of course, my favorite one, um, Diet low in omega threes may make teens anxious. And who has a teenager out there, right? You know, and aren't they anxious? So, like, amazing, we could solve that too. So, stepping back from the whole thing, I wanted to talk about what was going on in the ocean, but I also wanted to talk about what was going on in my personal health, and I also wanted to talk about human health because the self interest quotient. So. Um, I set out to try and do this book that was trying to kind of toggle back and forth between these two poles throughout human health and environmental health. And I'm hoping that I got somewhere that maybe could fix both. But let's start with the very beginning. So in the beginning, um, you know, a lot of people, when you ask them, where do omega-3s come from? And they'll say fish, right? You'll think, oh, that's fish. I got to eat fish because it's omega-3s. Well, fish have omega-3s, but fish don't really make omega-3s. Where, where do omega-3s actually come from? Well, actually, everything comes from the sun, right? Solar radiation beams down onto the ocean. But what makes it into omega-3 fatty acids are, well, the first things that made it were photosynthetic bacteria and then eventually photosynthetic phytoplankton. These very early creatures took the sun, transformed them, transformed solar energy into sugars and tissue, and that would allow them then to pass on that energy and tissue onto higher life, life forms. But interestingly enough, the very first creatures that started doing photos, photosynthesis didn't necessarily have omega-3 fatty acids. They had to invent omega-3 fatty acids later on. Why? Because of climate change. But not the kind of climate change we're experiencing, the kind of climate change that sent things in the opposite direction. So when phytoplankton first emerged, the Earth was cloaked in a blanket, a thick blanket of CO2. And CO2 make, made the Earth quite warm. Um, 
However, if you are doing photosynthesis, you are actually stripping CO2 out of the atmosphere, emitting oxygen. Um, and what's going to happen if you have enough of those little tiny creatures stripping all that CO2 out is that the atmosphere is going to get thinner and thinner, and it's going to get colder and colder. So at a certain point, the atmosphere actually probably got too cold uh, for phytoplankton to continue doing what they're doing. So they needed an adaptation that would help them adapt to cooler temperatures. And what was that? That was the omega-3 fatty acid. It was contained within this new brand of phytoplankton that had these omega-3 fatty acids. And omega-3 fatty acids, so what is the omega-3 fatty acid? Let's just do a very quick chemistry lesson. Um, and apologies here. Um, I got a C minus in chemistry. Who else got a C in chemistry? Raise your hands. Come on. All right, good. This, you know, fishy people and C people in chemistry go, go hand in hand. So I have to say that writing this book was, was difficult because there was a lot of chemistry and because I got a C minus in chemistry. I think in the course of writing this book, I brought myself up maybe to a C plus. Um, so I, my goal was that nobody in the C range should feel alienated by this book. And the people in the A's and B's, well, they could go along with a red pencil and correct all of my mistakes. But actually what I did is try to avoid those things altogether. So what is the omega-3 fatty acid in very simple layman's terms? Well, it's just that you see behind me, they had their first double carbon bond between those carbons that are three carbons in from the omega end of the molecule. So if you know your Greek alphabet, which I don't, but I do know that there are two sides of it. There's the alpha side and there's the omega side, sort of the A and Z of the Greek alphabet. And so the person who came up with the nomenclature for omega-3 fatty acids, a guy named Ralph Holman, who was actually um, a scientist, a fat scientist working for the Hormel company. He was very intimately involved with spam, believe it or not. Um, so Ralph Holman was a, was a Baptist, a Southern Baptist growing up. And um, he, he had read, you know, like many people who are sort of steeped in liturgy, he had knew a lot of these, you know, parts of the Bible by heart. And the phrase that stuck out with him is from, from Revelation, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And he just, he said to the writer Susan Allport, who wrote a very good book called The Queen of Fats, he said, I don't know, something about omega just kind of rolls off the tongue. So he called these things omega-3 fatty acids. And so that double carbon bond, three carbons in, makes these molecules just really active, dynamic. They, they, they move around. They, um, they, they can oxidize really quickly, which is why if you don't refrigerate, they can go bad. But they made membranes very the, the, the actual membranes of these phytoplankton much more supple than they would have been without omega-3 fatty acids. They also solve a kind of essential problem, um, which is that um, the phytoplankton that are in the marine environment, they capture the sun. But how does that energy then go from the sun all the way up to these larger animals? Well, they do it in this way by incorporating the energy and then moving it up the food chain to higher and higher levels of life. So like in the example here, you see this is, this is a very, you know, the marine biologists in the room will sort of groan looking at the simplicity of this because actually marine ecosystems are much more complicated than this. But basically what happens is that solar energy uh, comes, hits the water, hits phytoplankton, they transform it into, into sugars and, and, and structure, and sorry, and tissue. And then you have a nux next rung up, which are called zooplankton. You see your krill and your copepods, zo from the Greek meaning animal. And then the next layer are these little silvery fish, uh, anchovies, herring, all these kinds of little fish that we normally don't eat, but which are very, very important to the marine food web. And then beyond that, the really large stuff that we eat and that are, is important to us emotionally, whales, tuna, and all these kinds of things. So without that inter, those intermediate layers, there's no way for the solar energy, for the incredible power of the sun to pass through to larger creatures like us. So in the first, I should say the first part of the book is called Algae's Tools. And it's, it's kind of a double entendre because um, Algae's Tools, what, what Omega-3s are algae's tools. They use them to adapt to an environment that was cooler and spread life throughout the world. But there's this other aspect that's interesting, um, another meaning to algae's tool, which is what happened to all those microscopic, microscopic phytoplankton when they died and sank down to the bottom? Anyone have any ideas? Oil became oil, exactly. Remember like in the 1970s, I think it was Exxon had that commercial where you see these dinosaurs roaming around and then they transform into oil wells and, and, you, and you leave the commercial thinking, oh, the oil came from the dinosaurs. Not true. I mean, amazing, an oil company lying. Can you believe it? Um, not true. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's a little bit of dinosaur in some oil somewhere, but most of the oil that we're getting is coming from these microscopic phytoplankton. So 
All right, here's a trippy idea. We're algae's tools because when you think about it, we are now burning all of that carbon that the algae buried into the ground, which made the earth, had made the earth much, much cooler. So now we're burning it, we're releasing it into the atmosphere, we're making it warmer so the algae will like it better. So what if we're not really the people ruining the earth? What if we're just part of some huge giant algae scheme? What if we're algae's tools? I thought that was kind of interesting, but you know, that was late at night and there are more interesting things to cover. So first, first chapter of the book, Algae's Tools, covers a lot of years of evolution very, very quickly. And moving on to our self-interest level, the really interesting thing I think about omega-3 fatty acids, probably the most interesting thing, is that um, they are very integrally involved in our nervous, nervous system. Up to 10% of the human brain is, is DHA omega-3 fatty acid. Um, when, you, um, when you think about it, the human brain is basically just a piece of fat on a stick. And uh, inherent within that package of fat and very important within that package of fat are DHA omega-3 fatty acids. They help with cell signaling. They help speed information or electri electrical impulses across cell membranes. So they're, in fact, very, very important to brain functioning. And there is this sort of interesting thing um, that, you know, again, if you kind of want to go trippy on the whole question of omega-3s. So anybody read the book uh, Sapiens? by Yuval Hariri. Great, great book, right? So that book makes this really interesting point, which is that, so humans arose, or so humans arose maybe like 300,000 years ago. They keep pushing back, maybe it was 400,000 years ago. But whatever the case, for the first 270, 300,000 years of human existence, we really don't have very much to show for it in terms of kind of like proof of civilization. We had some stone tools, we killed a lot of land animals, but basically nothing big was happening that the rest of the world would remember forever. But interestingly enough, somewhere between 10 and 60,000 years ago in different places around the world, you start to see evidence of agriculture, you start to see evidence um, of advanced language, of advanced communities, and at the same time what you start to see is evidence of seafood consumption. Um, somewhere around 30 to 60,000 years ago, you start to see giant piles of shell middens where, and, and why they did this, I don't know, but it's possible that we killed all the land animals and we needed to eat more stuff. And so we turned to the sea and we started pulling shells and so forth out of the sea and we started eating them. And there are these very interesting moments of correlation where, for example, there's a cave in South Africa called Pinnacle Point. And at Pinnacle Point, they found some of the earliest piles of shell middens right in the same vicinity as the earliest cave paintings. So is that causation? Did they eat the shellfish? And they were like, oh, I got to paint something, man. <laughs> um, or is it just sort of coincidence? This is something, and as you'll see as I go on in the talk, this question of correlation versus causation is primal and, pri and, and, and central to this whole question around omega-3s. And it's really a question around of trying to understand what, what caused anything. And it's one of these essential questions of science that is so, so important. I think, in, in, especially in this, in this world we're in right now, where science is being questioned at every turn, this battle between causation and correlation is really, really key. So of course, let's go back to our self-interest, though. Um, as I telescope and move forward in time, I start in the book to talk about the question of dietary supplements, particularly omega-3 supplements. So, the first dietary supplement, the first omega supplement, might have been something called Roman garum. So garum was this very, very smelly fish sauce that was harvested all throughout the Mediterranean. Um, it was probably first introduced by the Phoenicians. And again, if you want to play around with this idea of seafood building big brains, the Phoenician alphabet, the phonetic alphabet, actually comes from, from the Phoenicians. They're the ones who introduced an alphabet to the Mediterranean. Was it all that fish they ate? Could be, who knows? But what they did seem to introduce was this smelly fish sauce made from the leavings of salt fish, these drippings that they would then put into a bottle and sell for pretty high prices. And as, it, uh, as civilization advanced, the Greeks loved garum, and then the Romans loved garum. You will actually find, if you um, go to the ruins of Pompeii, and you were, if you say you were trying to kind of, without knowing anything about the Roman Empire, if you're trying to reconstruct what the Romans were based on what is actually found at Pompeii, you would say, oh, this was a civilization of fish sauce makers. Because the most common thing that you're likely to find at Pompeii are little vessels uh, for garum or some big vessels for garum. And also one particular garum maker for, is, is inscribed in mosaics throughout the city. 
Um, you will actually find garum vessels uh, on the road uh, to England, um, along the, where, the, where the Roman legions went. So it was somewhere in the Roman psyche that this was essential, that they had to have it along with them when they went on the road. And interestingly enough, when some Spanish scientists took garum, they, they actually recreated the process by which garum would have been made. They found it was very high in omega-3 fatty acids. So another interesting correlation. The next step forward, though, was cod liver oil. Who ever remembers uh, taking cod liver oil, right? So you know, that's how we can completely uh, you know, figure out the demographics of the audience, right? It was, you know, particularly uh, people who are, I would say, 40 years old and older are often the ones who had that spoonful of cod liver oil shoved down their throat. Either that or they're Eastern Europeans or Scandinavians. Um, so cod liver oil uh, was this thing that, it was actually originally made by Vikings. Um, cod store their oil in their livers, probably because they can eat more easily shuttle um, oil over to their eggs for reproduction. And I should note that sperm cells and egg cells are probably the highest in omega-3 fatty acids after brain cells. So it's very much tied up in reproduction. Um, cod liver oil so was this very, um, uh, it had a very early kind of talismanic quality to it, especially in Scandinavian countries. But later on uh, in the 18th century, it actually was proven to have true medical effect. And what was the medical effect? It wasn't for cardiovascular disease. It wasn't for building brains. It was for a disease called rickets. So rickets, um, if, if copyright allowed me, I would show my slide of rickets, but it doesn't. But you'll have to imagine some very wan, bow-legged children. Rickets uh, is a bone-weakening disease, and it has to do with a vitamin D deficiency. And during the years of the Industrial Revolution, when we started burning all sorts of horribly dirty sea coal, when we started building our cities up and more vertical, sunlight was blocked out. When urban populations with poor nutrition became the, the norm rather than the exception, there was a widespread vitamin D deficiency. And it was found in some of the very first clinical trials that a vitamin D deficiency could be cured with um, cod liver oil. So that's why we all have this idea of cod liver oil being sort of medically proven. Because in that case, it really was actually a godsend. Going forward, though, there are, of course, more dubious things. Um, American snake oil, for example. So um, believe it or not, American, the snake oil thing, you've heard about the, the, the snake oil, you know, it sort of comes up as sort of buzzy things in conversation. But there actually was a snake oil salesman, a, an original snake oil salesman. So in the early 19th century, this guy, he was this cowboy, and um, he claimed that he had wandered away from his camp and he ended up in the camp of some YP Indians out west. And there he started a, an internship with the local shaman who taught him the ways of the snake oil ritual. And so once um, he returned from the wilderness, um, this cowboy would go up on stage and he would cut open a snake and he would drain the oil into, into a vial and then somebody would come up from the audience and they would take it and they would be cured. And they would be cured. But what's funny is when you look at the, the snake oil uh, labels in the bottles and, the, and what they advertise, they're advertising the same kinds of things as omega-3 fatty acids. Oh, you know, uh, inflammation, right? Who's ever, you know, you hear about inflammation everywhere? So inflammation, joint pain, sciatica, all these kinds of things come up again and again with the snake oil thing. So actually, snake oil was one of the things that moved the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to start or to come into being and to start codifying drugs and start to have actual real ways of testing what worked and what didn't work. Um, but then sometime around the 1970s, this fellow came along. along. So that's me, obviously. And, but next to me is a guy named Jorn Dyerberg. So Jorn Dyerberg is a Danish scientist, and um, he's in his 80s now, very lovely man. Um, in the 1970s, um, he was just a, a medical student, and his supervisor, Dr. Hans Bang, said to him, uh, he, they, he, Dr. Bang had, had, you know, we've probably all experienced this, the, you know, your supervisor comes in and says, I have a great new idea. What we should do from now on, it's not an aquarium, it's going to be a terrarium, right? Like they totally changed things completely. So this is kind of what happened to Dr. Dyerberg. He was just doing simple cardiovascular stuff. Dr. Dr. Bang bursts in and he says, no. I've just read this paper that in Greenland, they are saying that Inuits have much lower levels of cardiovascular disease. And he said, Jorn, let us go. We must go to Greenland. We must do the testing. We must understand everything about these people because soon they will switch to the Western diet and we will lose all this possible evidence that could change society as we know it. So, so they went to Greenland 
And this is actually um, Jorn Dyerberg's diary um, that he kept. Um, it's, uh, it's actually bound in the seal skin of um, people from, uh, of, of the Inuits who killed seals there. And um, I don't have the, I can't show the actual pictures because of copyright law, but I was just up in Svalbard, which is near Greenland. So this is kind of the way it looks. And you're likely to see these racks and racks of seafood drying. This is actually in Norway, but in um, the, um, the Jorn Dyerberg pictures, imagine seal skins hanging up or seal flesh hanging up there. So that was a major part of the Inuit diet. Um, they didn't eat really any carbs. They didn't eat any vegetables. They mostly just ate fatty fish. And when they looked at their, their blood, when they actually did an analysis of their blood lipids, they found very high levels of EPA and DHA omega-3 fatty acid. They also knew from the article and from the uh, health records that they had very low rates of cardiovascular disease. So Inuit people have a diet that consists mostly of oily fish and, and marine mammals and have high levels of omega-3 fatty acids in their blood. Inuit people have very low levels of cardiovascular disease. Therefore, omega-3s, fatty acids, prevent cardiovascular disease. Does anybody have a problem with that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the essential problem. It's correlation and causation. One does not necessarily equal the other. And in fact, so this is a classic example of what is called an association study. So association studies basically say where there are chickens, there tend to be eggs. Did the chicken cause the egg? Did the egg cause the chicken? Well, we don't know. We just know that chickens and eggs tend to kind of coexist. And if you do enough association studies, it might prompt you to do a more thorough study where you would actually try to understand if the chicken actually caused the egg. Association studies are not really considered the top of the evidence pyramid. They're considered the, a, a beginning. Um, because if you take association studies too far, it's like this one, right? I live in a White House. The president lives in a White House, therefore, I am the president, right? It doesn't work. Um, so, so in the early days of omega-3 fatty acids, it was all based on association studies. And they did start trying to do more rigorous testing into the 80s and into the 90s. And they started doing what's called a randomized control trial. And basically, in a randomized control trial, you know, we would have we would put Michael on the omega-3s. We would put John on a placebo. They wouldn't know what they were taking. I wouldn't know what they're taking. So we ended up with a double-blind, double placebo-controlled, randomized control trial. I wouldn't even know that they were named Michael and John. I wouldn't even know that. But at the end of the day, they would be two data points. And if John dropped dead and Michael stayed alive, we'd know that Michael was on the right thing or whatever. You know, you see what I'm saying. Um, the randomized control trials for omega-3s didn't start until the industry really started to ramp up. And there are many things, and I go into much more detail in the book, which is available for sale for $27.95. Um, but uh, um, the, 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 once they started to do these randomized control trials, and, and especially recently, we're starting to see these randomized control trials that are starting to show not so much effect. And in fact, um, you might have heard the news today. This, a, a story exactly like this broke. But as I was sitting down to write this book, the Journal of, uh, of the American Medical Association did a, what's called a meta-analysis, a study of studies of randomized control trials, and found that omega-3 supplementation was not associated with a lower, a lower risk of all-cause mortality, cardiac death, sudden death, myocardial infarction, or stroke. Interestingly enough, this whole sudden death thing, I never realized that that was actually a clinical term. But do you know that half of all patients first report heart disease to their doctors by dropping dead? Um, it's, 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 it's strange. There's this thing called sudden cardiac death. It's actually a diagnosis. And it's just like, hi, doc, uh, and you're dead. And, um, and there is some evidence that maybe omega-3s help with sudden cardiac death, which is kind of bizarre, right? Like, that's, oh, there's something that would stop me from just dropping dead. Well, if it's there, it's there. Um, anyway, so this kind, these kind of big studies are what's coming out and what are really kind of starting to drive people kind of crazy in this giant world, which I call Omega World. So in the course of writing this book, you know, I went to the um, Global Organization for EPA and DHA Fatty Acid Conference at the Ritz-Carlton in the Canary Islands. So let's understand that this is a pretty wealthy business. Um, people were, with this, this study had just come out, people were losing their minds. They, oh my God, there's no association with, with, with lower cardiac death. But as the conference went on, I found that they took comfort in the fact that there were all these other ways that you could express how omega-3s might work. And I guess by the time I left the conference, I came to the conclusion that the omega-3 is kind of the Forrest Gump 
molecule. I, I, in, it, again, in the non in the copyright non copyright approved version, I have actually a picture of Forrest Gump sitting next to a fish oil pill. It, it's much more effective than this. But omega is as omega does. Um, you know, it, it, it's this thing. It's like remember who's seen Forrest Gump the movie, right? So good. You're you're more gumpy than fishy. So. Um, Right, Forrest shows up at these moments, right, where he's like, Forrest is with Kennedy, Forrest is when Nixon is in China, Forrest is fighting the Vietnam War, and you're never quite sure, is Forrest causing these things to happen, or is Forrest just sort of there when they're happening? So that's the kind of confounding thing that seems to happen with omega-3 fatty acids. Um, there is, however, another thing going on, uh, which is sort of standing in the background of supplementism and, and supplement making, which is this entire giant industry that most of the world doesn't know exists called the reduction industry. So most fish oil is coming to us, most, most omega-3 supplements are coming to us from the reduction of little fish like Peruvian anchoveta. Some years Peruvian anchoveta is the most caught fish in the world. Actually, almost every year it's the most fish caught in the world. Um, you know, we catch about 80 million metric tons of fish a year in some years. Uh, Peruvian anchoveta have been 10 million of those 80 million metric tons. All of those fish, 99% um, of them get ground up and turned into industrial product. The reduction industry, though, you know, in case you sort of can't really develop an emotional attachment with a Peruvian anchoveta, it's important to remember that the reduction industry has been reducing marine life for over 300 years. When we think about, say, for the whaling industry, I mean, we have all have this sort of vague kind of Melville idea that we needed to have uh, whale oil for lamps, and they like light the street or something. I don't know. You don't really remember. But in point of fact, there was two. There were two ages of whaling. There was the first age that was indeed the sort of lamp oil phase. But then, um, once we'd sort of pr pr replaced whale oil with petroleum and other, you know, things to light our homes. Uh, we started using whales for other things, and we started using them in particular for margarine. So uh, beginning around the early, early 1900s, a process was invented called hydrogenation, where you can take a fat, and bomb, a liquid fat, and bombard it with hydrogen atoms and um, fully hydrogenate, full, uh, hydrogenate the, 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 uh, the, the fatty acid chain so that it becomes solid. It doesn't melt at room temperature, which of course is very good for industry and you can carry it around. It's much more easy to use. Um, and suddenly it seemed like the world was in need of a new oil source. And what did they use? They used whales. So if you're older, say, than maybe 60 years old, you've probably eaten whale. You probably had it in the form of margarine. The other thing that they used whales for was actually to make uh, explosives, nitroglycerin. It was actually a key, um, uh, uh, marine oils are a key part of making explosives. And whoever saw, who saw the movie Dunkirk? Do you see the movie Dunkirk? Yeah. So like, uh, interestingly enough, so both whale oil and fish oil can be used to make explosives. After the British defeat at Dunkirk, um, the first counteroffensive that the British did after losing horribly to the Germans was they assembled a group of Norwegian commandos, sent them to the Lofoten Islands in Norway, and had them blow up a fish oil factory. That's how essential fish oil was, because it was a key part of making nitroglycerin. So anyway, so we've had this tradition of, of reductionism that's been going on for a really long time. And now we're even actually going after krill which is in the Antarctic, which is actually whale food and penguin food. And it's, you know, this is like the craziest story at all. So when I was working on this book, I interviewed the head of the largest krill harvester out there. And, um, and, he, and he made the argument that, um, so that, so krill oil is supposedly it's a phospholipid, and I won't go into it, but basically it allows it, according to this guy, uh, to be more readily absorbed by the human body. Now who, those of you who've taken fish oil, who has ever experienced a fishy burp? You ever experienced a fishy burp? Oh, yeah, I see a lot of fishy burps out there. So, so according to the krill people, because the krill oil is phospholipid, you can take a much smaller pill, and then you don't have a fishy burp. And I was like, huh. And I, so I'm talking to this guy, Halvard Murray, um, from Acker Biomarine. And I was like, I was like, Halvard, are you, are you telling me? that you have a $200 million operation where you send people down to the Southern Ocean, you take this food that should be for whales, and you make it into a supplement, and you, and you do this mostly for a fishy burp, to avoid a fishy burp, and there was kind of a pause in the line. He's like, well, yeah, that's part of it, yeah. So um, it's, it's always interesting interviewing Scandinavians. I find that they're always very assured 
in interviews, and it's like you don't challenge that at all. And then I got off the phone. It's like what for fishy burp? What? So, um, so yeah. So that's this whole other way of of the way that we're going after these little creatures. Interestingly, though, the real thing that is pushing the supplement industry and is really pushing the reduction industry doesn't have to do with supplements or fishy burps. It actually has to do with a crisis in land food agriculture that we started to experience around the 19th century. So this is a picture I took um, uh, off of Chimbote in Peru. And that white stuff on that island there is actually a giant mountain of bird poop. Um, this, um, this, these, this guano, there's a, a string of what are called guano islands all up and down the Peruvian coast. And what are they basically are Peruvian anchoveta that have passed through the, the intestines of a, of a seabird and become poop. And this poop was incredibly valuable in the 19th century. We were sending warships down to Peru to mine this poop and to bring it back to the United States and to Europe because all of our soils were failing because we'd over harvested them, we'd torn up the native sod, and they'd lost the fertility. So all this guano was extremely, extremely important. And after we started, after we kind of took all that guano out, we started actually going after the fish themselves to the point where we now take out 20 to 25 million metric tons of fish from the world, that's all over the world, um, for the purposes of making basically dust and oil. How much is 20 to 25 million metric tons? Well, it's a quarter of all the fish we catch. So one pound out of every four pounds gets reduced. And if you weighed it all together, all of those reduced fish equals about the weight, the human weight of the United States taken out of the ocean every single year. And what are we doing it for? Well, well, in the, in the early days, it was corn um, and, and fertilizer, because again, we'd lost a lot of the natural uh, fertility was in the soils. Later, we went to chickens, um, because we found that chickens actually grew much faster when they had a diet of fish. Later, we moved on to pigs. Um, pigs um, in um, animal husbandry, um, when we started to kind of industrialize animal husbandry, we wanted to wean pigs much more quickly from their mothers. And I should say, what, the main way that mammals get DHA, omega-3 fatty acids into their brain is through nursing. So actually, women have the ability to take what's called a short chain omega-3 fatty acid like, uh, that usually comes to us from vegetable sources. They can actually, women can actually elongate that into these EPA and DHA omega-3 fatty acids, and then that gets incorporated into infant brains. And that's why this recent thing that dust up with the Trump administration and breastfeeding, I was like, are they actively trying to make us stupider? Maybe they are, I don't know. Um, anyway, back to the pig story. The pig story is that um, when you wanted, when industrialized pig production really ramped up and you wanted to wean pigs at a younger age, well, suddenly those pigs lack the nutrition to make it without mother's milk. And so fish was a natural uh, feed additive to all these things. Now, the thing that's really getting all these uh, omega-3s from all of these um, little fish uh, is salmon and aquaculture. Aquaculture is the fastest growing food system on the planet. 80% of all of those little fish are going to aquaculture. And an increasing share is actually going to omega-3 fatty acids, so it, into, into dietary supplements. So that's where it's all going. But at a certain point, I realized that, you know, especially with some of these big studies coming out showing limited effect of omega-3s, I started to realize that there was something much bigger than omega-3 supplements going on, that there was really a question of the food system. And that's when I started to think about um, not just about seafood, but about land food. So the land food that we eat, the main things that we produce in this country are corn and soy, and then we feed them to chickens, pigs, and cattle. Um, and what does that give you? Well, it, it, it gives you products that are high in what are called omega-6 fatty acids. You didn't know there would be a villain to this story, but the villain is the omega-6 fatty acid. Actually, to tell you the truth, the omega-6 is not a villain. It's actually also an essential fatty acid. We can't make them ourselves. We need them in our diet. But right now, we have a diet that is very much skewed in the direction of omega-6 versus omega-3s. So you, you, you have your omega-3s that's mostly coming to, to us from seafood and omega-6 coming from land food. And so you have this kind of competition between omega-3s and omega-6s. And what is interesting is there's actually a physiological competition going on between omega-3s and omega-6s. Omega-3s um, tend to lead us down the direction of resolution, whereas omega-6s tend to lead us in the direction of inflammation. There are people who dispute this whole thing. There are people who say, well, no, as long as you have enough omega-3s and omega-6s, it's fine. If you go into omega world, Omega World will tell you that oh, the balance is really important because actually if you have too many omega-6s in your system, you can't take those vegetable sources of omega-3s and elongate them or you elongate them at a much slower rate. 
whether or not you believe in omega-3 versus omega-6, it's very clear that there is a pattern of omega-3 food versus omega-6 food that reflect uh, a certain level of healthiness. I mean, you look at all the omega-3 foods. We're talking about seafood, leafy greens, but also in economic systems that might be better, smaller farms, producing vegetables. I mean, that's the kind of thing that would probably lead us in a healthier direction. Not only would it necessarily address inflammation, but also obesity, possibly type 2 diabetes because it's going to be lower in high fructose, fructose corn syrup. And then you have these omega-6 systems, which are very high, very high in saturated fats, high in added sugars, all these kinds of things. So again, whether or not you believe omega-3 versus omega-6 is, is actually important in the human body, it is very important as food systems. And why is it important? Well, it's important in the environment. So this is a map of my native state of Connecticut. Every dot on that map is a dam. So there are over 3,000 dams in the state of Connecticut. I often say that this is why people in Connecticut are so uptight. Uh, because, you know, their, their chi is blocked. If you could just unblock Connecticut's chi, maybe they would relax. But to tell you the truth, people in Massachusetts are pretty relaxed, and I think if you were to draw a similar map of Massachusetts, you would see a similar number of dams there, as in Rhode Island, over a million dams, and probably met many more obstructions overall in this country. And what were they built for? They were built primarily to grind corn and wheat. Um, land food, omega-6 foods. And what did they prevent? They prevented the migration of shad, herring, salmon, sturgeon, all of these fish that basically have an omega-3 profile. And there's another way in which we're preventing um, uh, healthier food systems exist through this sort of omega-6 system. So this is a huge fertilizer pile, uh, a picture I took um, when I was working on a story about the Mississippi. This giant pile of fertilizer, these huge fertilizer depots are everywhere throughout the industrial agricultural Midwest. And actually that fertilizer pile, you know where I took that picture is Walnut Grove, Minnesota, which is where Little House on the Prairie was written. So can you imagine what Pa would think if you put him on top that giant pile of fertilizer? All of those fertilizers are washing into our waterways over-nitrifying all those waterways, making them um, susceptible to coastal dead zones. So now we have a dead zone in the, state of, um, in the Gulf of Mexico that is larger than the state of New Jersey some years, all because we have too much land food being grown, all because we're having too much nitrate fertilizers washing in. And then there are other sort of really bigger things going on because of this omega-6 land food system, um, primarily having to do with carbon. So, after energy production, production of land food is the highest source of carbon in what humans do on Earth. And all this production of, you know, you have all the corn and soy, which is very high energy to produce, pigs pretty much energy, and then you have cattle, which are huge amounts of energy, and on top of that, cows are farting all the time, very high in methane, and methane is a much more potent greenhouse ga gas than carbon dioxide. And this is affecting ice at both ends of the pole. It's shrinking the polar ice caps, which is in turn shrinking the populations of krill. It's also starting to cause, so the ocean is really a giant carbon sink, and it's really been doing us a huge favor for many, many years. But now we're starting to overreach the capacity by which the ocean can absorb carbon. And when we reach that capacity, then the actual, acid, the actual uh, pH of the ocean starts to change. And we're starting to see a gradual process of ocean acidification. What happens if the ocean becomes more acidic? Then we start to go back to our initial schema of the way life actually works. And those middle rungs, your krill and your copepods, those shelled creatures that stand between phytoplankton and higher life forms, those can actually start to dissolve in a more acidic ocean. So if we keep going down this land food road, this high carbon road, we could potentially turn this diverse interdependent complex life that we love in the ocean into what's called a microbial loop where you basically just have phytoplankton blooming, they die, they're consumed by bacteria, those, ingredient, those components are reassembled into more phytoplankton and so on and so, so forth. It never reaches higher life forms. Very sad ocean that we don't want to have. So the big question, um, can we eat our way out of all this? I mean, take everything with a grain of salt because I'm a food writer and I would like to think we could. Of course, there are much bigger things probably need to happen in terms of people's mentalities. But to start with, I think we could do something very important by shrinking the land food portion of our portfolio. Um, right now, we eat 210 pounds of land food meat per year and only 15 pounds of seafood. Um, so if we started to shrink that down and started to bring it more in line with seafood, I think we actually could make some really positive changes. Um, seafood carries with it a tremendous amount of benefits. I mean, I have to say, I'm always worried 
when I present this idea of making seafood more central to the diet. But remember, I'm not necessarily talking about vastly increasing the seafood component of our diet. I'm actually talking about lowering all animal protein to the point where we have very little animal protein in our diet, and hopefully a large portion of that very small amount is coming to us from the sea. Um, this was actually the model. Um, so one of the things I look at in the book is the Mediterranean diet. Mediterranean diet, they went, um, a guy named Leland Albao, and this is what I write, write about in the Times tomorrow, he was invited to Greece to help improve the diet of Crete after the war. Um, uh, he went there and he looked at the way people were eating and he found um, that these very poor Cretans were living five years longer than Americans. They had no chronic disease and no cardiovascular disease to speak of. Um, they were eating hardly any meat. They were eating a lot of vegetables. They were, and the, the animal protein they were eating was split 50-50 between land food and seafood. So that's the model I'm imagining. I'm, I'm, I'm imagining something which, I, which Michael called the pescatarian diet, that is a Mediterranean diet with only a couple of portions of animal protein a week, and those couple of portions, hopefully a large portion of that is coming from sustainable either fisheries or aquacultures. So how can we as Americans, how can we embrace a pescatarian diet? Well, one thing is to protect what we've got. Um, this is Bristol Bay. It's the largest salmon fishery in the United States. It's the largest sockeye salmon fishery in the world. Um, has up to 40 to 60 million fish uh, coming into it every single year. Um, it was. Uh, it's always been a tremendously important and vital fishery, but this is what's coming down the pike. Um, the, uh, the Obama administration had actually tried to put Bristol Bay off limits from mining development, but as soon as the Trump administration came in, Scott Pruitt settled with what was called the Pebble Partnership, and now this mine that was effectively dead, which would be the largest copper and gold, gold mine in North America, atop the largest salmon run uh, in North America, now they're seem to be inching head with this project. So we have to protect what we've got. We've got to protect the salmon. We've got to protect sockeye salmon, which is a tremendous resource for us. And we have to stop things like pebble mine. Beyond that, though, there are things that we could do, I think, in our normal eating patterns. We could, instead of reducing all these little fish like anchovies, we could start to eat them ourselves. Because it turns out that anchovies are extremely carbon efficient. Um, it's much more carbon efficient to catch these little fish, which you catch in nets that don't drag the bottom. Um, they are very quick to reproduce, and so it's actually a good fish for us to be targeting. Um, they're high in omega-3 fatty acids, and we also could be looking at things like mussels. Mussels, um, also high in omega-3 fatty acids, extremely low in carbon footprint, 30 times more efficient than beef. Uh, you don't have to feed them anything. They actually get big and plump, plump and fat just by filtering the water. Um, and they filter a lot of water. They can actually remove nitrates from the water and make our marine environments healthier and cleaner. And this is very important because it's not just the Gulf of Mexico that has a large marine dead zone. There are actually 400 large marine dead zones all around the world, and that number grows every single year. And we could also think about kelp. Kelp is a tremendously good remover of nitrates from the water column, also very good water filter, and also potentially actually very um, consumable by humans. It's high in protein, um, can have omega-3 fatty acids, so it's actually a good component to the human diet. The other thing that we could do is we could think about rethinking our land food systems. So corn is this tremendously what they call a leaky crop because you have to harvest, you have to plant it and harvest it every year. The fertilizer leaks out, it gets into waterways. But we could look at this other kind of grain that's being developed now uh, by the Land Institute in Kansas called Kernza. And what Kernza is, it's a perennial grain. It grows root systems that are as deep as the native prairie that we displaced when we put in all that corn. It can go for seven, eight years without having to replant. Um, and so, it, and this grain in particular, we wouldn't use it for feeding animals, we could use it for feeding us. And lastly, there's the whole question of aquaculture. So, I know there are a lot of people out there who, who feel ambivalent about eating farmed fish. But to my mind, there's really no solution other than aquaculture if we're trying to get a point where we each have a little bit of fish on our plates every single week, we being the entire planet. So if we're going to do aquaculture, we're going to need something that's feed smart. Um, we're going to need something that's not eating all these fish. And you'll see in the book for $27.95 that you can um, get all of these um, different kinds of feed into the aquaculture food chain that would make it a much more productive system. We'd like to have a fish that's fast growing uh, because every time a fish grows slowly, uh, it costs us more from a carbon perspective and from a financial perspective. We'd like to have a fish that's adaptable 
um, and not just to the changing climate, but also to interesting paradigms out there. Now, I know in New England, the whole question of offshore wind is hugely, hugely controversial. I myself am feeling, often feel ambivalent about it. But when you look at the potential of offshore wind and then you couple that with the potential to join that with offshore aquaculture, there are some interesting ideas out there. Moving aquaculture, particularly fin fish aquaculture, out of the near shore into deeper water, co-joining that with offshore, aqua, uh, with offshore wind could be a very interesting solution in terms of lowering, lowering carbon and increasing a sustainable food supply. And lastly, this fish that we grow, we'd probably want it to have an oily fish profile. Um, I will say that after all this omega-3 research, I do think that there is a correlation between decent levels of omega-3 in the blood and overall human health. Whether it's just the omega-3s that are doing that or a combination of things, I couldn't tell you, but I do believe, you know, so I actually, during the course of this research, um, I found this company called Omega Quant. You can actually pinprick your finger, send your blood in, and we'll tell you what your omega-3 fatty acid level is. And when I did that, after eating fish every day for uh, every meal for a year, I had the um, blood lipid levels of a, a Sicilian fisherman, eight, circa 1875. Um, but I don't know that all of us have to go in that direction, but I think the idea of having oily fish in our lives is probably overall a good idea. So I guess in summary, I would say, you know, if we can all start to think about an omega-3 world, not just an omega-3 supplement, but an omega-3 world, where we embrace these exciting new ways of eating that are right there before us, that are fully deployable right now as we speak, if we use these things that you see up on the screen, we might just have a little bit more of this. So thank you very much. So yes, and now, now we're, we'll take some questions, if there are questions indeed. You can just, you can just take the questions and just repeat them. OK, OK, back. good. Yes, in the middle. <laughs> yeah, so the question was, um, so um, this was, a uh, woman in the audience had see, heard on the radio that some of the greens that we eat are high in omega-3s. So yes, yeah, so they're high in what are called alpha-linolenic acid, ALA, short-chain omega-3 fatty acids. Now, every nutrient has its supporter out there, right? You know, I have to say, you know, like when I went to these like nutritional conferences, you know, there's the probiotics people, the prebiotics people, you know, everybody has their thing. And there are people out there who say, who are really into alpha-linolenic acid and they think it's great. Within the world of marine omega-3 fatty acids, um, people tend to think that they don't necessarily, that, omega, that short chain omega-3s don't necessarily have the same heart and brain benefits that these long chains do. What, they, what is interesting is that the human body, particularly pregnant mothers, can take that ALA and upgrade it into EPA and DHA. So that's why it's, you know, it, it, it can be a part of your diet, but if it turns out, and I think jury is still out, whether like in pure supplement form, whether omega-3 fatty acids are necessary, but if, if we truly want those marine forms, then either we have to eat fish, or perhaps algae is actually a form of long chain fatty acids, or we have to think about lowering our omega-6s because it's those omega-6s that stand in the way of the elongation of the alpha-linolenic acids. Yes? Yeah, would omega, the question is, would, would the omega-3s in walnuts and flax seeds fall into that? Yes, they would fall into that category. Yes, on the end. Does the content of omega-3 change in your brain as you age, or has there been any research? Well, um, I think your brain itself shrinks. You know, I don't know that the, necessarily the proportion of omega-3s in your brain changes over time. I mean, there are different kinds of studies that say different things. Um, uh, and certainly the omega-3 industry would have us believe that we need to continue to supplement, you know, that we want more omega-3s in our brains so that, you know, our brains stay healthier. Um, I, I, I'm not 100% certain where the, research, where the most current research is on that. Yes, in the back. Yes, Rob. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So the question is, as somebody who likes, who thinks science is good, what's my um, feeling now about these? Mo you mean the study that literally came out this week from Cochrane that showed no effect of omega-3 fatty acids? Well, so my feeling is, um, so that has to do, th so that study was specific specifically on cardiovascular health. And it's not, it's funny to me that this keeps making news because there, there just keep being more and more of these large meta-analyses that seem to show no effect. Every time one of these happens, I go back to the omega-3 industry and say, what do you got? You know, what's going on here? And they throw up different things. They say, well, you know, it could be that, the, you know, there were randomized control trials that showed significant effect of omega-3s in the 70s and 80s, or the 80s and 90s. Uh, the advent of stents, the advent of statins, which all, um, you know, address a lot of cardiovascular issues. There, the feeling within the omega-3 world, within omega world, is that that is masking the anti-inflammatory effect, the natural anti-inflammatory act that omega-3s are having. Um, could be, I mean, there, so there's a huge study coming out in November, actually, from Brigham and uh, Women's Hospital called the VITAL study. Um, and that's coming out in November. It's like just, you know, tens of thousands of subjects looking at all different categories. So I've kind of got my eye on that one to kind of, and I do think that's a good study, and I think that will tell us something really important. Um, oftentimes, the other problems with the studies is that they might, t earlier studies have tended to look at people who have already suffered a heart attack. Like this is, this vital study is one of the first studies that really looks at healthy people over time and whether or not there's a cardiovascular effect. Um, the other side of the coin, though, is this, is this neurological side, the, the brain function. And to me, what really stands out is the fact that our brains are so much composed of DHA omega-3 fatty acid. And I guess the question becomes really, uh, do we need to supplement that? I mean, we lived as a species for hundreds of thousands of years without an omega-3 supplement, right? So it would lead you to believe that maybe it's not altogether necessary. On the other hand, we didn't have all these processed foods recently. We didn't have this diet that leaned towards omega-6. Maybe, and there are actually indigenous populations of people who live nowhere near the sea who are perfectly healthy, but who do have a diet of wild game that browses on wild greens and they themselves are browsing on wild greens. So they may have naturally upgraded those short chain omega-3s to make healthy brains. So I think Personally, if I was like the omega-3 god, I would pull, I would kind of maybe abandon the field of cardiovascular stuff and really look much more intensely at the brain because it is such an integral part of the brain. I think that's where the research really should focus going forward. Another question? Yes, in the back. Yeah, that's you. Describe your experiences Well, you know, you should talk to my family about that, really. Um, so it was interesting. What, one of the most interesting things was it caused me to reevaluate re the supermarket itself and to understand just like how much meat I was actually eating. Like I always think of myself as sort of an environmentally sensitive guy. And I would, you know, people ask me, are you eating a lot of meat? And it's like, no, no, I don't eat that much meat at all. Um, but it turned out I was eating quite a bit of meat. I was eating, you know, at all kinds of meals and snacking and so forth. So that was one thing. The other thing was interesting was looking at the seafood counter as my only counter. And so, you know, I think a lot of us, you know, kind of think of that there are four things out there, right? Like chicken, pork, beef, and fish. But fish actually represent thousands of different kinds of animals out there. And so suddenly, when I only had fish as an option, it was much more interesting to see the, you know, my palate got much more sensitive to the flavors and textures and all the different varieties of things that you could get in the seafood counter. So that was probably the biggest effect. Other question? Yes. You know, ever, so did I come across any differences between um, eating so, well, do you mean between eating food, or do you mean different kinds of supplements? Um, I mean between eating the foods that I get here in the Yeah, I mean, so this is, I mean, again, so the question is, was there, did I come across differences in research when comparing, say, um, the effect of eating something like, or taking something like spirulina versus eating fish? Um, you know, I would say that every product has their line of research that says their product does the most. But I didn't come across anything definitive that said an allergy supplement was any worse than a, um, than a fish oil supplement. Um, I did generally find, though, there, 
most nutritionists that I spoke to tended to think that it was better to get omega-3 omega fatty acids into your body through food. Um, for a couple of reasons. One of them was, you know, we don't know what the co-nutrients are with fish that could possibly lead to better bioavailability and absorption. And, and that's one of the things. I mean, I think, you know, I've always been um, an admirer of Michael Pollan, and I think his whole argument in, in defense of food of nutrition, against nutritionism, this, this idea that we don't need food anymore, we just need nutrients. Um, I think it applies to fish. And, and it's actually, I think, to a negative extent, affected the way that um, particularly Americans look at it. Like, I was doing a talk in New York, and somebody raised their hand, and he said, you know, I, I used to take salmon, but now I take krill oil. And I was like, you, you took salmon? It's like, no, 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 I ate it. You know, it's like, so we've developed this kind of weird idea around seafood that it's a nutraceutical, that it's not a food, and, and that the only reason we're eating it is for omega-3 fatty acids. But when you look at fish as a package, um, it's a actually really efficient and good way of getting nutrients into our body. I mean, a, a whole range of nutrients. I mean, fish generally is lower in calories, lower in saturated fat, um, and, and delivers the same, if not more, protein than, say, you know, other forms of, of, of animal protein out there. So it's a really... You know, it's a good way of eating, and if we can just kind of get over the fact that it's, it's not medicine, that it's food, I think it would lead us in a better direction. The other thing I've heard, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, supplements is that if you're going to take a supplement, taking a supplement out of the context of other lipids, like in other words, if you're just having like a dry piece of toast and then you pop a fish oil pill, your stomach in some ways is not really kind of, you know, getting psyched up to be absorbing lipids. So that's the best sort of layperson explanation that I can offer. Yes? <laughs> totally. Yeah, so the good, excellent question. So as, as humanity prepares to move to Mars, metaphorically and literally, um, is there anything going forward in terms of synthesizing omega-3s? Like, 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 could we just make them, right? Well, the closest that has come in that direction is um, there's interesting stuff going on with canola. So canola is a, um, you know, is a plant. It's actually, you know where the name canola comes from? It's actually Canada oil. Um, what it is, is a rapeseed crop that has been modified in order to remove a kind of odiferous quality that most people didn't like. But the canola plant um, is something that we know pretty well. And starting about maybe, I might have, the research might have started 10 years ago, they started doing gene inserts into canola plants where they took um, genes from moss, from, um, from algae, and from other very primitive organisms, and they were able to actually, now are able to produce a plant that literally grows marine quality, long chain omega-3 fatty acids. Um, I know people don't love um, uh, genetic modification, and certainly there's reason to raise an eyebrow when any new creature appears on Earth. Um, it is interesting, though, to think that instead of, um, you know, boiling down a lot of wildlife, we possibly could just grow these things. On the other hand, once you get involved with land agriculture of any kind, as we learned early in the, in the, in the talk, land agriculture is expensive from a, um, you know, just from a, from a carbon perspective. So, and then there are people doing stuff, people are working with bacteria doing, doing gene inserts, they're working with yeast. So these things are just down the road. And, you know, that's why uh, a lot of times when we're talking about omega-3 fatty acids, whether or not they're essential for humans, they are actually are essential for a lot of aquaculture. So to grow fish, particularly salmon and salmon and trout and things like that, they actually do need omega-3 fatty acids, and it is a limiting factor in how much fish we can grow. So if we could figure that out on our way to Mars, if we could figure that piece out to grow or to synthesize omega-3 fatty acids, that might potentially open the door to a whole new range of, uh, of foods that we could eat. Okay, two more questions. Yes. <laughs> Oh, it's not, so excellent question. Um, she, it's not, it's, she asked, what, is, what are my thoughts on the mercury question? So the mercury question is a big question and I'm glad you brought it up. I had meant to bring it up. Um, so you has, had asked me about, um, uh, about what was it like eating seafood for a year? Well, so I did end up with quite high mercury levels after eating seafood for every single meal for a year. And I actually, um, Halfway through, I had high, high mercury levels, and I stopped eating tuna because tuna is actually the largest source of mercury in the American diet right now. Still, my mercury was high, and um, and actually at the time I was at a, happened to be visiting with a, uh, a public health official in Alaska, and um, 
he said that basically if my if he'd seen a villager come into his office with levels that I had of mercury, he would have sent somebody out to his village and told him to stop eating so much whale blubber. Um, so it was it, it was high. Um, when I cut back to two portions a week and I looked at you know eight lower on the food chain and so forth, it, that problem more or less went away. I do think though there's an interesting connection between you know there's obviously a huge connection between mercury and coal. There's an interesting study that came out, I think, out of New England, where they found that bluefin tuna, that the mercury levels in bluefin tuna had considerably declined after a lot of the power plants in the region switched from coal to natural gas. And so I always wonder, like, where is the seafood industry, you know, complaining about the, the pass on coals, on mercury scrubbers and coal? Because, like, you know, the coal industry is probably seriously affecting, if very least, the, the, the perception of seafood. If we could fix that mercury problem, I think we would probably have more people eating fish over time. All right, so last question. Hopefully it's a good one. Or maybe there's none. Oh, yes. OK. Yes. So after your year of eating fish, are you feeling much better? <laughs> after my year of eating fish, am I, eating, am I feeling better? Um, I, um, you, know, <laughs> there, you know, in medical science, there's always confounding factors. And the confounding factor uh, when I was doing my year of fish was that I was also making this frontline film and I was also writing a book. And I, I would suggest to you, nobody, if you're ever thinking about writing a book, don't sell the rights to the book to a filmmaker before you finish the book. Um, because, you know, it was throughout this time I was trying to write this book and I remember David Fanning, who's from Boston, and uh, he, he, he's, you know, he was sort of looking over my shoulder the whole time I was writing. And he'd see, he kept saying, he's a South African, he'd say, send me your pages. I want to see your pages. And I would send him my pages and he would read them and he'd go, I don't think your omega thing is working. And you know, like again and again, so it was like, so I was in a constant state of crisis and despair as I was working on this book. And so the year of eating seafood coincided with the end of the filming of the documentary and the completion of the film, so I felt great. Um, but in all seriousness, when we looked at the large metrics around uh, my experiment, triglycerides, cholesterol, heart rate, all those kinds of things, nothing changed from beginning to end, which again brings into these larger questions like how do, you know, are we even measuring the right things? I mean, I can't, can't tell you the number, but like I read a book called The Cholesterol Myth when I was working. There's a lot of people who think that cholesterol is a big pile of bunk. What is interesting is that some of these big meta-analyses that have done been done around diets seem to, again, association studies, but seem to show that a pescatarian diet or a Mediterranean diet or a pescatarian diet, these kind of low protein diets, low animal protein diets, a certain amount of fish seem to lead to overall longer life and lower chronic disease. But again, seem to, I mean, it's association studies. The people who are eating this way, eating a Mediterranean diet, they're probably wealthier. They're probably getting more exercise. They're probably a little bit more educated about their food choices. So there's all these confounding factors. So that's where I'm at this point. I'm going to eat pescatarian to see what it happens. And I'll race you, Peter, to the finish line. <laughs> who dies first, you know? <laughs> so anyway, thank you guys so much. I'll go back and sign some books. Uh, please come and say hi. I'm happy to answer more questions there. And those are all my social media feeds. All right, so just on behalf of the School for the Environment at UMass Boston and the New England Aquarium, thanks for coming to the lecture series, to our last spring lecture. Um, as Paul mentioned, you can head out and he'll sign some books. Hopefully you have some interest. Um, this is the last, as I mentioned, the last lecture of the spring series. The fall series starts on September 13th. We have Roger Gentry coming, who will be discussing his research with Northern Fur Seals. We have a Fur Seal theme exhibit, so that's part of that, that run. Um, please check out our website in August, and you'll see the full lineup for the fall series. Finally, and importantly, um, surveys. Please place your completed survey. Thank you for those that, that were able to fill it out. Um, on the registration table where you first checked in in the lobby uh, when you first came in. And thank you for completing these. Definitely, we value your feedback. And uh, enjoy the rest of your summers, and have a terrific night. Thank you for coming.